as Brother Paul was just saying here a few minutes ago, there's nobody alive that's seen more miracles than Brother Billy Paul. He traveled with his daddy since he was 14 years of age. He gave out prayer cards. He was in the meetings. Up to 500,000 people came out because they saw the reality of God. That we serve a living God. Not a God that's a God of history or a God that's dead, but he's living today. And it's been manifested amongst us. And, you know, as I was, I was thinking about that the other night, we were talking to the young people, you know. Brother Billy Paul was there in Durban, South Africa, when uh, the mayor of the city... Uh, Sidney Smith called them and told them to step out onto the balcony of the hotel where they were staying after the meetings and here was seven cattle truck loads of crutches, wheelchairs yes. and so forth of people that have been healed in the meetings and they were coming by the hotel and the people walking behind them singing only believe because that's what it's all about, only believe he stood out there and he witnessed that. Yeah. You know, uh, and so I just picked up a, a book, you young people, if I don't know if you've read A Prophet Visit South Africa. It was actually written by Julius Stratcliff. I met him maybe 30 years ago, 35 years ago. But he went over to Africa and he followed the meetings around just writing what he saw and what he heard and taking the clippings out of the local newspapers. But there was Florence Shakari. I think she was down to 37 or 39 pounds, dying of cancer with no hope. And Brother Branham prayed for her, and she believed God. Here she is six months later, 155 pounds. Jesus Christ truly is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I thought, here's Brother Billy Paul and his daddy and a woman. They brought a 14-year-old a, a girl in there with a broken back. And she was terrible in pain. Brother Branham was preaching, and all of a sudden he called her out. She's, who, me? He said, you get up out of that cot. God has just healed you. <laughs> she got up out of that cot. The mother was so excited, she passed out, <laughs> seeing this take place. Yeah. There's a picture of Brother Billy Paul there with it. And uh, I just tell you this of you young people. Like, here's a, a, a young boy who was crippled. He wear those leg irons, there's his crutches, there's his shoes with one about this much longer than the other. Prayed for him instantly, his foot stretched out. There he is holding his shoe and the crutches and the thing. Jesus Christ, the same. And here is a man that has witnessed that, has been there, been part of it. You know, as I look at this here, he's a little bit smaller back in these pictures. And, but if any is want to read this book, ask one of the deacons for it back there, because it's so interesting. There's so many interesting testimonies, and then to get somebody who's been there, and then it's even nicer when you get to witness uh, a man that's been there. Uh, my wife had a little operation a few years ago, and I thought it was kind of interesting, and he was a doctor from South Africa, and uh, I said, man, I, I was just over there. He said, oh, he said, what were you doing over there? I said, well, doing a little bit of missionary work. And he said, well, what do you believe? What denomination do you belong to? Well, I said, we believe that God sent a prophet in this last day. He looked at me, he said, William Branham? I said, yes, sir. I said, how did you know that? Well, he said, uh, one of the sisters in the church had given him a book, this one here. And he said, he took it home. His dad was over there from South Africa. And he said, my dad just enjoyed it so much because he remembered when Brother Branham was over in those meetings. You know, and, and that just encourages your faith. And you take a look at that picture on the wall of the pillar of fire. My God coming down, Houston, Texas, 30,000 people showing his grace to us in this generation. Vindicated by a pillar of fire. We didn't have all the cameras and things that you could do that with then. It's, it, that pit, if you want to see that there picture, you go to Washington, D.C., and they've got it filed there. That's the God that we serve, brother and sister. And so this morning, we're so happy to have our special brother, Brother Billy Paul and Sister Lois with us. And you just be here ready to receive whatever you have need of. Just believe with no doubt, and you watch God come on the scene. So at this time, I'm going to ask our precious brother, Brother Billy Paul, if you come. Thank you. Well, I learned one thing real quick. Don't leave your notes lay out on the desk at Brother Dave's house. So he just gave my testimony. I hope you enjoyed it. 
Lois, I told you somebody come down the steps, let me know. <laughs> but it is an honor to be here with you. My, I just feel right at home. As I walked in this morning, thank you, Brother Paul. As I walked in this morning there, I drove. I don't know how much Brother David won't really wanted to speak. He said, you take the family to church. And I said, okay. And I went out and he didn't leave me the keys. And I'm not about to walk. <laughs> well, anyway, Sister Donna said, we'll just take the other car. But you know, when I come in here and I've seen all the cars there, the first thing, you know, every, <clears throat> everywhere you go, you know, I've, I've been there with Dad. And I remember when <clears throat> the Lois and I first got married, the first place we ever, I ever took her was right here at Prince Albert. Daddy said, I'm going up there amongst those Canadian people and those Eskimos. And he said, they love, <clears throat> he said, they love the Lord. And no matter what the weather is, they come to church. Amen. And I would adventure to say there's as many people here this morning as there is in any message church that I know of in the States. Thank you for your love for the Lord Jesus in this word. You know, when I grew up, When I get up of a morning, and you older people, you've heard my testimony many times. I'm kind of going to direct it here this morning, okay? I was just a little kid, and I'd get up, come upstairs, and I'd look on the kitchen table. There was telegrams. Telephone rang all night long. People, I'd go and look out in the yard. I was about like, just, just about like, your little boy is there, David. Now look out there. I wanted to go out there and play basketball. You know, I was just a kid. There was ambulances. He said, ain't nothing wrong with that. Did you ever get up and want to go play ball and there's ambulance in New York? <laughs> no, you haven't. Did you ever get up and there was insane people running around the house with straight jackets on? No, you didn't. I did. Wheelchairs. Taxi cabs, buses, just to get a glimpse Amen. of God's prophet. Yes, we even had possums come to our house. <laughs> they even stayed for a couple of days. They was all crippled up, but when they left, they was healed. Amen. Because God sent a man, a man sent from God. I don't worship the man but I glorify the God that was in the man. Like I say, if God thought it, Brother Ram spoke it, I believe it, and that settles. You say, you said that. I say it every day of my life. They say, you just say that because it's your daddy. No, I don't. No, there was no mistakes. And they said, do you worship him? And I said, no. I said, but neither do I compromise on what he said. I don't have to understand it, but I truly believe it. We just get kids. Man, we get up. You know, we, we lived in a fishbowl. Brother Paul knows what I'm talking about. You know, you live in a fishbowl. Everybody looks at you. You can't do anything right. Every time, you know, anything happened, who done it, Billy? The deacon kid, oh, they're the worst. How many deacon kids do we have here today? Come on now, Tim, sit down. How many deacon kids do we have here? You were the meanest of all. You'd always come at the house just time it was supper time. I don't know how you planned it, but you always come to Brother Bram's house at supper time. And everything that would go wrong, it would be Billy Dunnett. Billy Dunnett. And I hate to see those deacon kids come. So that's the reason this deacon kid is taking me hunting. Okay, Tim. <coughs> Becky, Sarah. Joseph, we all grew up in that fishbowl. And you know, after they'd leave, Daddy would, you know, he, he, he just had a way he could do it in the right way. And I'd get in trouble, and he wouldn't just say, Billy, I'm going to whoop you good. He just had his way of saying things. And if you listen real close to the message, he's got real things to say to you, too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay? Yeah. You ask me to come, I come. So I I'm going to unload the whole load on you this morning. So you hear that message and you say, whew, he's really pounding on me. Say, thank you, Lord. Yeah. 
Just go back and check it with the word and you'll see it's right. So he'd come there and those kids would go in and get me in trouble all the time, Trina. And when he did, he'd say, Billy, uh, when Brother Creech leaves, uh, you and I got to go uh, get some wood. Well, he thought, bless Brother Billy, ain't him and Brother Branham really close. He's going to take him out and bring some wood in. Uh-uh, that's not what he was saying. The wood was on the backside, you know what I mean. So we are just like you. Joe, I know you all been, how many of you have been to Stillwaters? Just look at that, isn't that, stand up. Look how many kids come to Stillwater. Amen. Thank you. How many was in July camp at Stillwaters? Oh, this last July, the first, first one. How many was on the 18 year old on up? Okay. Out of that camp come the Copa boy from Colorado. He came, he played the same games that you played. He ate the same food that you ate. Two boys, one went home with a blessing. The other one refused. I got a letter last week and says, pray for my boy. He says, all I want to do is blaspheme because I have no hope of being saved. Don't never let Satan tell you that. The coupled boy from Colorado, just as soon as he went home, he got on his moped, <laughs> took over an errand for his parents, and he got killed. But he was filled with the Holy Ghost at camp. The other boy went home and said, I want to blaspheme because I can't live it and I don't believe it. They both went to the same camp, slept in the same dorm you slept in. One, eternal life, and the other one refused. What was your meeting this weekend, kids? Yeah. Choices. Yeah. You love me? Yeah. Choices. Amen. What you decide this weekend, determine your eternal salvation. Amen. Choose you this day whom you will serve. We go home. We, we just like you. Daddy would take us out. Did, did you enjoy the trivia the other day? Yes. Oh, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. I just felt I wanted to do that for you. Because Daddy, he'd love to take us and give us questions and answers. And we'd take out. We'd, he'd take us for a ride out in the country. And he'd ask us questions, you know. And as we did, you know, the things begin to happen. And, and I was the oldest, so I was the smartest. No, that's not right. But anyway, anyway, if, if you answered them right, you got a dip of ice cream. If you didn't answer them right, you didn't get nothing. And if you got all of them right, you got a double dip. <laughs> it didn't bother Daddy one bit if you didn't know the answer. And if mom and dad ask you a question, it doesn't matter whether you can answer it or not. But if they tell you the answer, Brother Bram asked you the second time, you was in trouble. So be sure and listen real careful to what the tapes say. Only what the tapes say. And mom and dad will tell you the truth because they are predestinated to do that. You love Brother Paul? You love your pastor? Kids? Your mama is your pastor at home. Amen. She's your pastor. She'll tell you the truth. So stay true to that word. Don't compromise on it one bit. We just eat breakfast there one morning. Or, no, I'm sorry, it was lunch. We sat at the table, and I had Brother Joseph, Becky, and Sarah. Well, you know, we're just kids. So Daddy would say, okay, Sarah, you pray. And so Sarah looked over that food and was having leftovers. He... he I'm, he had a lot of wisdom. He knew I didn't like, you know, leftovers. So he asked Sarah to pray. She looked over the table. She says, no. Daddy said, what? He says, pray, Sarah. She said, I prayed over this yesterday. <laughs> so see, we was just like you, okay? Joe come in one day, and this lady lived next door, and her name was, you can laugh at some, and she laughed. And, this lady come in, her name was Mrs. May. Lois knows her real well. But I thought she delivered our children, one of our children. And so she lived next door to Daddy, but she wasn't a Christian. Here she come, boy, she was upset. 
she come chopping in the house like that. And she says, and she says, I want to see Reverend Branham. Mom said, well, he's in his study. I'll go get him. So she went back here and she said, Miss May wants to see you. And he said, okay. So I come out and he said, hi, Miss May. So what can I do for it? And she says, I just had Joseph over at my house. He was about, well, he wasn't as big as Luke there, just a little smaller than that. Said, he was over at my house and said, he told me that you called me a witch. He said, Miss Mom, go get Joe. So she goes over and she gets Joe and she brought him out. And Daddy, I thought, oh, boy, I'm going to watch this. He's going to get a thumping, you know. And so she brought him in there and he said, he says, Joe, Miss May said that you called me a witch. He said, you did. Daddy said, Joseph, you know I didn't do that. You sure did. He said, where? She, he said, Sunday at the church. He said, I didn't call Miss May a witch. He said, yes, you did. He said, what do you mean? He said, you said any woman that puts on a clothes like that is nothing but a witch. He said, Miss May, I said that. So see, we was just like you. Becky, oh man, her and George. Oh. Daddy wouldn't let the phones be tied up. So they had a little signal between them. At 7 o'clock, where they set their watches at, they would go and Becky would take your phone, and you could just follow this card and see where she's at. And she'd go in there, and she'd go, and she'd go in the closet, and you just start pulling that card, and you'd find Becky sitting in the closet. Oh, hello, George. <laughs> the phone wouldn't even ring. They just had to pick it up at a certain time, and they could talk to each other. Kids are smarter than what you think, Mom and Dad. You see, we was just like you. But you know what? I wouldn't take nothing for that. You've got Christian parents. You should be so thankful. That's your heritage. When I was just a young boy, I started traveling with my dad. Now I'm going to get into the testimony. And I'm going to try my best to be done here in three hours. But as I began to travel, my dad would tell me, just like you hear the tapes and you hear your mother and dad tell you different things. But until you have, until you have a personal experience with Jesus Christ, it's just words. You've got to be born again. When I was 12 years old, how old are you, Luke? I was a little bit older than Luke, probably not as big, but I was. But anyway, my dad, I'd hear him talk about the angel. And I love to tell this part of my testimony, and I know every one of you has heard it, but I'm just going to tell it to you again. I'd hear my dad talk about the angel. And Brother Bram not only preached you a message, but he lived you a message. He was a poor man. He wasn't a rich man. No, he wasn't a rich man at all. And he'd stay in the cheapest of hotels. He'd eat less food and have us too, so that it wouldn't be hard on you for the expenses of the meetings. He not only preached your message, but he lived your message. We stay in this little hotel in Vandalia, Illinois. And I was about 12 years old. And he woke me up one morning, and I'd, I wasn't giving out prayer cards then. I was just a little bit a little bigger than Luke there. But I was selling three little books. One was called, I Was Not Disobedient to Heavenly Vision, Divine Healing in the Branham Campaigns, Jesus Christ the Same Yesterday, Today, and Forever. I had a little nail apron. I'd have it around me. Had nickels, dimes, and quarters in there. I thought I was something. And I'd go down and I'd give you, you know, sell you books before the meeting started and the tent meetings. When I come home that night, my dad was sleeping in a bed right here. I was next to my dad and my uncle, Donnie, was in the bed next to me. It was all in the same bed. Never even had a bathroom in the hotel room. We had to go down the hall to use the bathroom. And over on the corner in the back by the window, there was a table, and I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. It It had, a, Lois, what you call them things, you pour the pitcher, you know, pitcher water and things, that's where we wash. 
And Daddy, he said, I had a pillow across my face. And he said, Paul? I said, yes, sir. He said, you know the angel that Daddy talks about? I said, yes. He said, he's here. He said, he's in the room right now. And he said, he visited me tonight and told me about the meetings, what to do. He said, I asked him if I could wake you and my uncle up, Donnie. And he said, you can wake up Billy. That don't make me no more than you or anybody else, but it was just what the grace of God to me. He said, you can wake up Billy. He said, I want him to see you. He said, when daddy takes the pillow from your eyes, he said, you look over where that war space is, and there stands the angel that I told you about. Well, I thought it'd be something, you know, that you see pictures of, you know, flying. It was a man dressed in a white robe. He had hair down to his shoulders, 200 pounds or so. He had his arms folded like that. And all he'd do would just move his head back and forth and keep his eye on Daddy. It scared me to death. You say, it wouldn't scare me. You just haven't seen him. There was a reverence I can't tell you about. But he says, he sent from the presence of God. And I grabbed my Daddy. I was scared to death. He said, Paul, he won't harm you. He said, I asked him if he could see you. He never spoke a word to me or to Daddy. But I'll never forget his eyes just looking back and forth at Daddy, back and forth. And I held on to my Daddy, and he clutched me up. And he went from that being like a man in that room out that window. Before he went, he just went into like a mist, like a vapor. And he disappeared out the window. And when he left, a rainbow at 3 o'clock in the morning come and stood in that room. From that day to this day, I can tell you when he's there. I might have been in Africa, India, anywhere I'd be. And Daddy would call the prayer line, and I'd be working the prayer line down there, getting the people lined up. And I could tell you exactly when he was near. Before Brother Brandon would even say, you know what I'm waiting on. You've heard him say on the tape. I'm waiting for him. I could tell that he wasn't there. And just as soon as he come, I knew it. I could feel it. Daddy said, he's here now. Amen. I've been a blessed man. Not only am I a child of God, but I'm a son of a prophet, and I'm a brother of a prophet. Amen. How much greater could a man ask for? Amen. So young people, when you feel that, when you feel that little nudge, that's him. Yield to it. And what he says, you do. You never question one thing on that tape. A lady come to me one time and she says, Brother Billy, no, I'm sorry, she wrote me a letter. She says, I heard you give a testimony about Boo Devil. I said, yeah. She says, the devil come to me and said he'd scare me to death. Said he'd talk to me. You don't believe that. The devil can talk. And he lies all the time. Do you know when he lies? When he opens his mouth. But he said he would scare me to death, that nervousness. And said, finally, one day I just bucked up against him. And she says, devil, she says, you frightened me all of my life. And she says, I want to ask you a question. She said, did you ever hear of the prophet William Branham? And said, that devil didn't say a thing. She said, answer me. And that devil wouldn't say a thing. She said, in the name of Jesus Christ, answer me. He said, that thing spoke and said, he's cast me into hell many times. And she said, I want to tell you something. I'm a believer in every word he said. And you leave me and never bother me again. She said, boo devil. And said, he's never come back again. So, just when he comes at you, boo devil. He's not your conqueror, you're his conqueror through Jesus Christ. Just don't be scared to know who you are. 
I seen my daddy, like I said, he was a poor man. And I'm going to get into my testimony now. I'm going to be done here shortly. But he got into, when he went out and started meetings, right here, he come through Canada in the early 40s. Brother Cook just talked about his father-in-law, the different ones. He never even had a suit. That's right, honey. He borrowed a suit from his brother to go out. And he had a hole here in his pocket on the side of it. <clears throat> my, mom, <clears throat> my mom went down, and I don't know what you call them, but it, it's an iron, an iron on thing that you do. And he hopped so he could hide that pocket. And he'd hold his hand like this, and he'd go up and shake hands with the preachers. And they all had dressed nice. And he'd say, I I'll shake you with my left hand. He said, because it's closer to my heart. He had his right hand, hand hiding that patch. But I'm a witness to you this morning. I seen, seen him walking to the auditoriums. Thousands of people. Tens of thousands of people. You know, remember, I'm not a, like I am now, I'm not an old man, I was a kid. And I seen people like you on stretchers, wheelchairs, cots, everything, just to get a glimpse of him. He was a Jesus man. They saw Jesus in Brother Brad. They knew if they could just touch that ragged coat, they'd be healed. So who are we? Who are we? The greatest of all, give his all, and we might have what we have today, eternal life. Don't never let it become common to you. I love you. But like I said, I may never get to see you again. But it's true. I've seen people. I've seen people just when he walked in. Just walk in the auditorium. And I'd have him by the arm leading him in. And I've seen people just stand up out of their wheelchairs. Push their wheelchairs back. I've seen them come off of cots. I've seen mothers pass their babies down through hundreds and thousands of people just to get him to touch that baby. Not even knowing if they'd get that baby back, but they knew that God was in that man. So do you know that God was in that man. I saw the Redeemer living in a redeemed one. I don't worship him, but I glorify the God that was in him. I may not understand it, but I believe it, and I don't compromise on it. I don't want to be no smile like, but I don't compromise on nothing to do that. My job was to pass out prayer cards, to get him in and out of the meeting. What a privilege. You say, oh, I wish I had. No, you don't want that job. No. It was a wonderful job. I don't mean that. I see him in a prayer line. He'd always bring the people from this side. And I'd bring the people up and set them in a chair. And he'd say, watch me. Watch me. And I'd see him. He'd go like this. You've seen him on the film. And I knew then he was getting numb. He didn't know what he was, where he was at. And I'd have the prayer line where I'd stop the prayer line because I knew it was time to go get him. And I'll tell you some testimonies that I saw. Yeah. But I'm talking about my job now, okay? My job was to get him in and out, to get you up there to be prayed for, just to stand before him. And I've seen him, I see him start doing this and be getting a little weak. And I'd stop the prayer line. And he knew when he didn't see no one in that chair, he might not even see me, but when no one was in that chair, then he knew it was time to, to quit because sometimes he didn't know where he's at. And I'd leave and come over, and I'd touch him on his side, put my arms around him. 
What a privilege. That anointing was so strong. It didn't make any difference if I had a headache, a toothache. In that presence, everything left. And I touch him on his side like this, Brother Paul. And if he was talking to you, maybe calling people out in the audience, and I touch him like that, if he didn't answer me back, I'd pick him up and take him off the platform. But he'd, sometimes he'd touch me back. The people didn't know. But he'd be saying, Paul, leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. Then he'd make an altar call or whatever. You say, well, that's, no, it's not. Because one time I take him out too early. I thought it was time to take him. I thought I was doing my job right. And I take him too quick. And he'd say, Paul, if you just left me a little longer, I could have prayed for some more. Oh, that's a kid, 14 years old. So I took him too quick. Then maybe the next night, I take him too early. Next night, I take, let him stay too long. Then he'd say, Paul, you let me stay too long. He said, don't give out prayer cards tomorrow night because I don't have strength to pray for the people. Don't feel sorry for me, but it was a hard life. But it was a wonderful life. I said, Daddy, why? Why did the Lord let me see that angel? He said, because you were called to work with me, son. Mm -hmm. I heard a tape the other day, not to Brother Billy, because I don't even deserve to stand before you. I'm not trying to be humble. I'm just pouring my heart out to you. He said, <clears throat> he said, <clears throat> if it hadn't have been for Billy, he said, I would have been in an insane institution long, many years ago. So whatever God let me do, I'm thankful for it. But he told you the truth. And God vindicated that it was the truth. Like I said, he was a Jesus man. God loved him so much. Now I'm getting ready to start. That he spoke of him right here in this word. Amen. If you believe it, say amen. If you don't, I'm going to quit. He spoke of him in his word. And at his birth, like on the trivia yesterday, the light came down and hung on. A man sent from God. He spoke of him at his birth. And when he was baptizing his 17th person on the trivia yesterday, Eddie Common, the light come down and said, as John the Baptist was sent to forerun the first coming of Christ, you will forerun my second coming. He loved him so much that in the Greens Mill in the cave, he said, You're, I'm, he said, if you get the people to believe you and be sincere when you pray, nothing will stand before your prayer, not even cancer. Not even cancer. He loved him so much that he had his picture taken with him. The only supernatural being that was ever photographed. Don't let it become common to you. Brother Branham said a man looked at that picture and laughed. And he said it was nothing less than to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. That's what Brother Branham said. He loved him so much that he put his name on a mountain. He loved him so much that he took him beyond the curtain of time. And he's seen every one of you over there. He said, all that you loved, come on now, church, all that you loved and all that loved you, God has given to you. Recognize who you are. Don't be ashamed. Amen. All that you love, God has given to you. You say, well, I don't believe that part. Then you might as well not even be baptized. Because you haven't even started right. All that the prophet said. He loved him so much. Men loved him so much. That picture 
A lady was laying in a hospital. Can I take a little more time? A lady was laying in a hospital. She was dying in Jeffersonville, Indiana. She said, Lord God, I know that that's your prophet. And she said, if he was here and he'd pray for me, I'd be well. She said, but he's not here. But I know the one I'm speaking to. That's you in that picture with him. Her testimony was that light come out of that picture, come over and touched her on a body, and she was made perfectly well. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I seen him walk in. I seen people with legs that much shorter than the other one. Does any of these mics work? I've seen people walk in. And they have legs that much shorter. I'd see him go over to them. And remember now, it's not no 77-year-old man. Just a little bit older than him. Walk over. Pull one leg up. This leg would be that much shorter. And he'd say, do you believe? I'd say, I do. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ, let this leg come forth. And that leg would grow. That leg would grow as he pulled it out. What a blessed people we are. I seen him go in Little Rock, Arkansas. A deaf and dumb school. The kids, the kids could not hear. They were in a special school. And when he left town, there wasn't one that couldn't hear. <laughs> I saw God in a man. There was a little sister in our church after daddy had gone to be with the Lord. Her name was Sister Madge Muirhead. Her husband drank all of his life. He, he wasn't mean to her. But he let her come to the special meetings that we had, the tape services, when you was a little boy. And he would just drink all the time. Not out in the taverns, but at home. And she said, I'm so sick of this. She goes up to the grave. She reaches down. And she gets her a handful of dirt. She opens up a handkerchief. She puts that dirt in there. She goes back to Texas, Beaumont, Texas. Her husband was drinking, laying on the couch, drunk. She said, Lord God, he's a good man. He's good to me. She said, but I don't want this in my home no more. She says, I know one time that there was a prophet and he died. And she says, they throwed a man on top of his bones and said he come to life. She said, God, I know there's a prophet. His name was William Branham. And I got some dirt. And I am a believer. And he's laying there, snore out. She takes that dirt and pours it on him in the name of Jesus Christ. The man never drank another drop in his life. I see him. A little bit longer. Yeah. I see the waterheads. Do you know what I'm talking about? You want to talk about that way? Waterheads, big heads. People had brain problems, children. That big. Be laying here on cots. They couldn't even set up. They had to lay on cots. They couldn't raise their heads. I seen him pray for them. They said, Do you believe, Mother? She said, Yes. He said, take a string and put it around that baby's head. And said, don't doubt. Measure it, then cut it off. And then tomorrow night, you bring that string back. And you measure that baby's head again. That string would be that long. Next night, it would be that long. Next night, it would be that long. Finally, that child was setting up just like you are. Perfect. It's all. Amen. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I was giving out cards one time. There was a lady. 
I brought him up the prayer line, and Daddy always said, Now, Billy, get the worst cases that you can. I said, Yes, sir. He said, Just don't give a person a prayer card because they got a headache or something. He says, Give the worst cases. I said, Okay. I brought this lady up to my daddy. He took me for him. Like I said, it was a hard job, but it was a wonderful job. And he looked at her, and he says, Yes, ma'am. He said, Sister, there's nothing wrong with you. I thought, Oh, my. Wait till I get back to the hotel. You know. He said, there's nothing wrong with you. I thought, oh, me, what did I do? And he says, no, ma'am. She said, no, sir, there's nothing wrong with me. And I thought, oh, man, I, I am in trouble. I knew he didn't make no mistakes, but I mean, I thought, there it is. And she says, no, sir, Brother Branham. She said, I come to you a few years ago. And she says, I told you that I wanted a baby. And she said, you prayed for me and told me I would have a baby. She said, I went home and testified to my church. I testified to my family. I testified to my husband. I testified to my pastor. I said, my pastor said, the days of miracles is past. It can't happen. My husband said, I told you not to go to that meeting. I said, you ain't having no baby. I said, my doctor told me I couldn't have no baby. And she says, I doubted what you said. And she says, I did not have the baby. And she says, I come to say I'm sorry, Brother Brown. Brother Bam looked at her. He said, thank you, sister. He said, that's noble. Ah, oh, Brother N. He looked at her. He said, sister, what did he say? What did he say through me? Not what I said. What did he say? She said, you said I'd have a baby. He said, I don't care what your pastor says, what your doctor says, what your husband said. If he spoke it, you'll have the baby. Nine months later, we got a picture of the lady have the baby. God don't make mistakes, and neither, and neither does his prophets. Mm, I like that one. I'd give out prayer cards, and maybe one evening I'd go down. I was telling Brother David about coming up the other night, and I, I just never did understand. He'd come to me, and he'd say, come on in the room before you go, and I'd say, okay. And he said, now watch the night. He'd say, I'll give Gregory those. He ain't going to bother me. He said, you look for a young man, about six foot five. And he said, he'll be dressed in this color and he have this color tie on. And he said, he's going to ask you. Now think of this now. Yeah. Come on now, church. Yeah. This is in a motel room before we ever got to service. Yeah. He's going to ask you for a prayer card and make sure he gets one because he's going to tell you he's got a stomach trouble. But that's not what's wrong with him. He's dying of cancer. And he said, if I don't pray for him tonight, he's not going to get well. Hello. Hello. Why didn't God heal him in the motel room? You've got to do something. Come on, young people. You've got to do something. Obey God. So he brought him. I'd look around. I'd see this big guy. He said, I want a prayer card. That's him. Because daddy told me what he looked like. I'd give him a prayer card. I'd shuffle up a hundred prayer cards, put them in my pocket. I'd give that man a prayer card. Now, think of all this now. I'm not trying to be, a, I'm just trying to help you here. Put them in my pocket. There's a prayer card. There's a man. I go over and I give him a prayer card. He takes the prayer card. He's called up in the prayer line. Brother Branham's in a motel room. It's done seen the vision. Come on, church. He done seen the vision, told me what to look for. Brother Bram hasn't seen me. He comes into the meeting. He preaches for an hour, hour and a half. So don't get upset with me if my testimony for three hours. He preached for an hour, hour and a half. And he comes in and he says, what prayer card did we call last night? And I said, one to 20 or whatever it was. He said, well, let's just start at number 25 tonight. Him. There's no way you can figure it out. Right. Only. Amen. Only. Amen. God thought it. Yeah. Brother Bram spoke it. I believe it. Yes. That's settled. Amen. I see him. I was in Germany with him. And I'm going to close here just a minute. As Brother Dave got into my notes. I 
I was in Africa, and I did have in my notes that testimony. I saw the seven truckloads of crutches, homemade wheelchairs, clubs, and 20,000, 25,000, I think they estimated, people walking behind, yes. singing only believe. Scared to death. I looked out over that great audience. There was 150,000 people on that Durban racetrack. There was ambulances lined up. And they, they wore them white suits, and, you know, ambulance drivers. They had on these white suits. And I saw them all get in a circle. I didn't know what they were. I, six, I was 16 years old. I wanted to be home. I wanted to be fishing. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I was scared to death. But I knew what that had said. And people lined up, and I seen these 17 people get in a circle, just like this, all in white. I didn't know whether it was going to attack Daddy. Everybody didn't love Brother Brown. Someone to touch him and someone to kill him. But it was my job to get him in and to get him out. And I wouldn't take nothing for my journey. Amen. I seen these guys get together in a circle. And I got with one of the ministers. I said, what are they doing? He said, I don't know. I'll go find out. And there was all these ambulance drivers in a circle. I didn't know what he was going to do. Is he going to attack us or what? He said, oh, it's okay, Brother Billy. And I said, what? He said, all 17 of them brought people from the hospital. And they don't know what to do because they can't find one of them to take home. <laughs> My, 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 my. Is he the same yesterday, today, and forever? God thought it. Prophet spoke it. We believe it. And that settles it. I don't need to hear none of this other nonsense because I don't believe it. Can I tell you another one? Two more. Three more. Four more. A lady came to me one time and she said to me, Brother David, she says, Brother Billy, I said, yeah. She said, I was prayed for it up in Indiana years ago in Brother Brown's meetings. I said, yes, ma'am. Now, this is in California or somewhere. And she said, she said, your daddy told me that I was going to be a missionary. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she says, I want a prayer card, but I want number three. I said, do what? She said, I want a prayer card, but it's got to be number three. And I said, well, sister, I can't do that. I said, I'll shuffle them up and pass them out. She says, Brother Brown prayed for me as a little girl and told me I was going to be a missionary. I went to India and I got a disease and I'm dying. She said, if I can get back home, Lord, and get number three prayer card. Now, don't lose me here. And I get number three prayer card. She said, I'll have faith to believe that I'll be healed again. So she said, give me number three. I said, no, ma'am, I'm not going to do that. Well, she's mad. I said, I'll be happy to give you a prayer card, but I don't know what number it is. Okay. So I gave her a prayer card. Boy, in about two minutes, here she come. And she wasn't pleasant. She said, I told you number three. I said, I told you, I can't do that. And she said, I want number three. You follow me, Bentley? Okay. She said, I want number three. And I said, I can't do that. I said, I give you the prayer card. I can't give you another one. Well, she was really upset with me. So daddy comes in, he's preaching away, and he said, well, Billy, what card did you give out? I said, one to a hundred. He said, well, let's start at a different number tonight. Let's start at number 98. 98, 99, 100. She was number three. <laughs> ah, yeah, God don't make no mistakes, and neither does his prophet. So he said, let's start at a hundred and go back." He never done that. He always went 25 to 50. He said, let's start at 100 and go backwards. 100, 99, 98. There she was, number three. Yeah. Ask, and you shall receive. Yeah. I'll tell you this one here. When I went to India with my dad the first time, like on a trivia, I asked you what city, Bombay. That day he was entertained by 17 different religions. And I sat there as a little boy, and I thought, good, as a young man, I was about 17 years old. And they began to talk about their gods and everything. And I thought, boy, when my daddy gets up there, he's going to tear their hide to pieces. They talked about their gods could do this and their gods could do that. I thought, boy, when daddy gets up there, he'll take care of that. He got up there and he said, thank you, gentlemen. 
He said, well, invite me to India. He said, I thank you for that. He said, I heard you speak about your gods. Buddha, Muhammad, all of them. He said, I invite you tonight to come to the meeting and to see the God that I come to represent in demonstration. He didn't argue with them. We don't argue. Just say what he says. So he says, if you'll do that, he'd come to the meetings. And that night, he walked over there and he says, bring me up a person, Paul. Well, you know, I knew whatever daddy had was going to happen. So I looked down there and I seen this man. He, didn't, he was just coated over with crust over his eyes. I never seen a person like that. It's just like you take a match and burn your skin. You know how it turns white? Well, that's all there was in his eyes, in his sockets, just crust. I brought him up to my dad, and he says, this man is totally blind. And he says, today I was entertained by 17 of your religions. And there they all sit, not you, there they all sit on the platform behind him. And he says, now you told me about your gods and what they could do. He says, how many of you people belong to these different religions? Them little black hands went up everywhere. And he says, now if any of your gods, come on now, don't leave me. Any of your gods, or all of your gods, together, come and give this man his sight now. You can put a sign on my back, a false prophet, and run me out of India. It was so quiet. He says, come ahead, brother. Not you. Come ahead, brother. Come ahead, man, gentlemen. Nothing happened. He says, neither can I. He said, but if the God that sent me doesn't come and do this, he said, then you can call me a false prophet and run me out of your country. He pulled that man up to him. Oh, I'll never forget his prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Who was he? What, who was this? Elijah. Who was this? Elijah. He said, Father, I thank you that you've already showed me. He said, fulfill your word. And he touched that man on his eyes. Let his eyes come open. Them eyes come open. He took and read the Koran Bible. Tens of thousands of people give their heart to Jesus Christ. Why? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is for you, you, you. I went back to India. When he got ready to leave, there was a little... The driver was so nice to Brother Brandon. And he spoke to him. He said, Brother Daddy, he says, thank you for being so nice to me, not talking to me and things, taking me to the meetings. He said, is there anything I can do for you? He said, yes, Brother Brandon. So I got a little crippled friend of mine. A friend of mine has got a little crippled girl. Said she tried to get to the meetings and she couldn't. He said, if you could just go by and just shake her hand. He said, it would mean so much to me. Brother Brandon said, Billy, let's go. So he drove us over to his friend's house and we went in. She was, maybe me, about like this little girl right here, about that size right there. And I forget, she's sitting in a wheelchair, like this, all crippled up, legs drawn up under, you see people like that, their arms like this. And he was playing ball, the kids were. We walked in the house, and Daddy greeted them, and they greeted Brother Brown. He looked at that little girl like that. He never asked him to pray for her. He walked in that house. He looked over there, and the kids was playing ball, throwing a ball back and forth. Brother Branham says, sweetheart, he says, do you like to play ball? And she said, sir, through the interpreter, I'm crippled. I can't, I can't throw a ball. I can't walk. He said, would you like to play ball? She said, yes, sir, I would. He never prayed. He picked up this ball. Yeah. I'm a witness. Amen. He rolled it down the floor. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ, go get me that ball. <laughs> that little girl was yeah. her legs went out. She got out of there and brought that ball to Brother Branham. Why? He's Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't you doubt it. Only believe it. It's the truth. Now, 
I just feel good. Got a phone call not too long ago. My wife did. This man says, could I speak to Brother Billy? And she said, will you call my husband at the office? So anyway, I, he said, sir. I said, yes. He says, do you have any tapes in the 40s? I said, a few. And she says, I want to, he said, I want to say something. I said, sure. He said, my mother. No, no, that's not what he said. Yeah, he said, my mother. I haven't given his testimony for a while. My mother was barren. And she couldn't have, or no, this lady, I'm sorry, this lady was barren and could not have children. And it says, Brother Brandon prayed and said, you'll have a child. He says, the people didn't believe it. And he says, and when she had the baby, said the baby was still born. Now, maybe you children don't know what I'm talking about, but it was born dead. And in those days, I don't even know what this, was it dead, dead basket, Lois, what they call it, dead basket? And said, when the baby was born... It was dead, and he threw it, hello, yeah. he threw it in his dead basket. And then the mother began to hemorrhage. And he said, if you've got a pastor or someone, you better get him in there because she's dying. We can't stop the hemorrhage. They went out and they got Brother Ed Hooper. You heard Brother Adam talk about him. He was out in the waiting room. He brought him in. He said, pray for this lady. He said, let me go call, make a call first. Said she can't live, said the baby's been dead 20 minutes, and we're not talking about that, but this lady's going to die. So he calls Brother Branham, tells him the story. Daddy said, what, what did this happen? He said, well, you told her she's going to have a baby. said, she had the baby, but it was stillborn. It's dead. And says, they want, want you to pray that the mother won't die. He said, give me a minute. Don't hang the phone up. He goes in, he prays, he comes back. He said, Brother Hooper? I said, yeah. So go tell her she'll be all right. He said, go tell the husband she'll be all right. And he said, so will the baby. He said, no, Brother Branham. He said, the baby's dead. So you didn't understand. He said, I understood you. He said, but she's going to be well, and the baby will live. So he goes that back in and tells her. And he says, you know what, sir? This man on the phone. I said, no. He said, I'm the baby. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Here in Regina, I believe it was Regina. But anyway, it's here in Canada for you Canadian people. My uncle that was in the bed with me, Uncle Donnie, he come there and we, we was bringing the prayer line up. And as we brought the prayer line up, here come this little girl. And she was on these, these uh, what do you call them, thing, polio braces, you know what I'm talking about? And these braces that goes over your arms. And she walked up to my dad like this. And she stood there and she had... She had something under her arm, like this. It was a box. And Daddy said, hi, sweetheart. Hello, Brother Brandon. He said, sweetheart. He says, uh, what you got there? And she says, uh, a pair of shoes. He said, do what? He said, a pair of shoes. He said, what you got this pair of shoes for? He says, because I can't walk. He says, but I know when you pray for me. Come on now, church. He said, I know that when you pray for me, I'm going to be well. Amen. Brother Branham said, sweetheart, go get you a little chair and sit down over here and watch the people as they come forth and let your little faith raise up. Hello now. He said, she sat down there. And said, Brother Branham began to bring the people up. And I watched them. That little girl just sat there like he told her with that little box under her arm, all crippled up. Hundreds of people in those days prayed and prayed for her. And she sat there. Then all at once, my uncle, the one that was in the bed with me, drove the trucks. He said, now, ain't that something? In his mind. You still following me? In his mind. He didn't say a word. In his mind. He said, now, if they need something, that was his brother in the flesh. He said, Bill had that little sweet thing that sat there in that chair. And said, the people's forgot about it. And said, he's forgot to pray for her. And said, the people's forgot about it because he knew that she was so crippled that she probably wouldn't be well. And said, ain't that something? You're done ahead of me. He said, he turned. She didn't, he didn't say a word. He thought it. He said, oh, no, Donnie. 
No, 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 Donnie. I ain't forgot her. <laughs> and Jesus ain't forgot her. Billy, go get her. He brought her over there. Here she come. I brought her over there. Here she come with that little shoebox. She crumbles up like that, all crippled up like that. He said, sweetheart, have you watched these other people get healed? And she says, yes, sir, I have. He said, is your faith right now? She said, it is. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ, give me those braces. He took them off of her. She put them shoes on and down through there she went. Perfectly well. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. There was a lady. Burlington, Vermont. I was, I think I was married to Lois then. I'm pretty sure I was. 56 years, you do forget. <laughs> but I think we were married then. Anyway, we got, I think it was, I think it was in 58. And there was a big commotion back about where Tim's sitting in the auditorium back there. And the people was hundreds of people in the auditorium. And Daddy was preaching away. And we just, just getting ready to call the prayer line. I was already on the platform. And he says, what's wrong back there? Was well, a man stood up. He said, Brother Branham? And he said, yeah. He said, I'm a medical doctor. He said, my name is Sidney Barton. And he said, this lady has just passed away. Well, the people began to get, you know, scared and emotional. You know, they began a disturbance. And he said, people be quiet. He looks over at me and he says, Billy? I said, yeah. He said, go pray for that lady. I said, uh-uh. Go pray for that lady. I said, she's dead. I said, she's dead, Daddy. I ain't going down to that woman. He said, Billy, go pray. I said, Daddy, I, I ain't going to do it. Bless his heart. He turned around like that. He said, that's okay, Paul. Wonder you hadn't whooped me. That's okay, Paul. He stood on that platform. She was several hundred feet, not several feet back there. I read in this Bible where Jesus Christ went to the grave of Lazarus. A man that had died. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. Brother Branham said, hello. Brother Branham said, if he had not have spoke the name of Lazarus. Is that right, Brother Paul? Is that okay? If he had not spoke the name Lazarus, and it would just said, come forth. He said, everything in the grave would have come out. Yeah, she's dead. I mean, I'm sorry, she's dead. I'm scared. I mean, I'm kidding. Jesus said, Lazarus. Brother Bradham had never been in his life. He looked down there. Mary? Jesus said, Lazarus? Brother Branham looked at that woman dead on the floor, stretched out. Mary! And when he spoke her name like Jesus spoke, Lazarus, he said, Mary! She jumped her feet. She says, what do you want, Brother Branham? Yeah. yeah. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm closing on this one, maybe. There was a little girl. She was just about this one size. I've seen a lot of miracles. Now I've got, I've got many pages here, but I know it's late. But I've never seen, thank you, I've never seen nothing like this. She had no eyeballs. All she had, sweetheart, was a little slit in her cheek. Skin over like that. No eyeballs. Brought her to my daddy. He said, sweetheart, you don't have no eyeballs. She said, no, sir. He said, do you believe what Brother Bram spoke tonight? She said, yes. He says, do you believe that if I pray for you, that Jesus will give you eyeballs? She said, yes. Daddy said, everybody put your head down. Everybody did but me. Because I wanted to see this. I've never seen nothing like it in all the miracles. I've seen everything. I've seen people walk like a dog 
on their hands and knees. I see him take a chain and just raise them up. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ, walk normal. There they go. But I've never seen nothing like that. Just a slit in the eyes, in the cheeks. He said, Lord Jesus, listen to me. Lord Jesus, create. <laughs> create these eyeless sockets. Two perfect eyes. I'm a witness to you. I guess that's why I kept my head up so I can tell you today. Amen. I saw a streak come down and go in that socket. Go in that socket. Two crystals formed. I seen it with my own eyes. Two crystals formed. Two perfectly normal eyeballs. He said, sweetheart, he stopped in the middle of his prayer. He said, sweetheart, he said, Brother Brand, I'm sorry. I forgot to ask you what color eyes you want. She said, I heard that blue was beautiful. He said, Lord Jesus, give her the most beautiful blue eyes. Out of that streak come a blue socket and a blue socket. She had two perfectly normal eyes. He's Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forever. I love you. I'm sorry I took so much time. But I want to end right here. This is the part I don't want to do, but I'm going to do it anyway because I feel led of the Lord. I've seen all that, young people. Now, you adults can just sit there. I've seen all that, but I didn't have an experience. I didn't have an experience. You must be born again. You must. All these things I told you today is the truth. More than likely, I'll never be with you again. When I meet you over there, my testimony, I told you exactly the truth. The devil come and he started talking to me. And none of you had a daddy like I had. None of you was raised in a Christian family like I was. I was without excuse. The devil come to me and he says, you've never smoked. You've never danced. You never went to movies. I never snuck off like some of you have. I never done those things. I honored my parents. He says, you don't know what it's like. What did I tell you? When he opens his mouth. What I experienced to you is the truth. I saw it. But that devil's real. He says, you've never done none of those. You don't know what it's like to dance, to drink, to smoke. I said, that's right. And I started doing it. I started to drink. I danced. I smoked. I played cards. I thought I was the best pool player there was. I knew nobody could play cards with me. I knew I had, as you say, the luck of the Irish. It's against the law to gamble in our country. I walked in a pool room one night. I, I don't want to tell you kids this, but I, I feel compelled. Yes, sir. I walked into a pool room one night, and there was a big card game, and people was coming down from Chicago. Well, I knew I could play cards with anybody. And I wanted some of that money. And I went to that pool room and went in the back room, which was illegal to gamble. And I walked in there, and there was people around a big poker table. I don't, I don't like even talking. I'm just I'm being honest with you. Around this big poker table. When it was around this poker table, the dealer was sitting there. And he said, son, out the door. He said, you can't play here. He said, this is a private game. Well, the guy that owned the place, I'm sorry to say this. He said, oh, yeah, he can play. He said, he, said, he, he, said, he plays up here all the time. He said, he said that's Reverend Branham's son. That dealer looked at me, and he says, are you Reverend Branham's boy? 
I said, no, sir. I said, Reverend Branham wouldn't have a boy like me. I said, no, sir. I walked out of that pool room, and I'd already left home. My dad, before I left home, he said, son, don't do that. He said, don't go down that road. I said, Daddy, I want to see what it's like. That's what the devil talks to you about. I had no experience. He said, son, don't leave home. I said, Daddy, I respect you too much to stay home. I left and went to live with my grandmother. But when I got in that pool room. I could not identify him with that kind of a life. He said, son, before you leave, will you do me a favor? And I said, okay, I'm going to be Brother Brandon, you be Billy. He said, give me your hands. No, not like that. I said, what do you mean, Daddy? He said, give me your hands. Raise your hands out, Billy. Raise them out. I said, yes, sir. He said, turn around on the wall. He said, see right there? He said, that's a cross. He said, you're standing right here today. He said, this road leads to heaven. This road leads to hell. He said, all daddy could do is tell you, don't go that road. He said, but you've got to make the choice. What's our theme? Choices. Make your choice. I said, daddy, I choose to go that road. He said, no matter where it leads you, son. He said, I can't compromise on this word. I can't make you live it, but Daddy will always be your friend, and I'll always be your buddy. But you can't work with me no more. It's all over. You can't live that kind of life and be like that. He said, but just remember this. When your so-called friends down here are so good to you, he said, remember, Daddy's here praying for you. And somewhere along the way, He's going to turn you around and bring you here because I claim you under the token. I made that choice and I went that way. Don't listen to his lies. Don't listen. You've got to have an experience with Jesus Christ. I walked out. I started living with my grandma. I'd done all those things that the devil told me I never had tried. I tried them. They're every one wrong. But at that time, I thought I was something. I went to church one Sunday, and I sat in the back row, Joseph. Sat on the very back row because I was ashamed. Guess what he preached? Return of the prodigal son. <laughs> Everything he said, I was guilty of. That finger is, you know what I'm talking about. Everything that he said was pointing to me. The Lord began to speak to me. Go to the altar. I refused. I didn't heed. Finally, one of the deacons come up. And begin to deal with me. He sat down beside me in the seat. He said, don't you want to go to the altar? I didn't make no scene, but I didn't want to hear him. So I got up and left. I didn't make no scene. I just got up and left church and walked out. About a week later, Daddy called me. Kind of like I was kidding Tim about hunting. I like to fish just as much. He said, hey, Paul. All the time, he was my buddy. He said, you want to go fishing? He said, the chubs, that's a one of our fish down in Indiana. He said, the chubs are biting. I know you like to catch them. I said, yes. He said, let's go fishing. I said, okay, Daddy. So we went fishing. He was on way down the riverbank. He never, he never come begging me to come to church or nothing. He knew how to handle every situation. And I want to leave this with you. I told you that I knew him. I'll come back to this. I told you I knew him. But I'm going to tell you, no better friend in the world than I have than Dave Cook, Brother Dave Cook. If Brother Dave Cook was standing here, or Brother Jim Neighbors, or anybody, 
And he'd say, Brother Branham, I know there's a good fishing hole. And I want to take you. And Brother Jim said, I got a plane. I'll fly you. Brother Branham would say, that sounds good. I could tell by the way he said, that sounds good. Whether he was saying, Billy, get me out of this. Or Billy, make the arrangements. But he wouldn't tell them. But I knew him that well. Help me here, Kurt. I knew him that well. But this is the key punch. But I could never tell his enemies from his friends. He treated every man and woman the same. Now, where was I at? I know, I know where I'm at. <laughs> Just takes, my name's Brandon. It takes me a little while. He kept getting a little closer, Brother Dave. A little closer. A little closer. He said, how many fish you got? I think I was ahead of him. I'm not going to say that because I'm in the pulpit. <laughs> but I think I was winning. And I, whatever it was, I told him. <laughs> and he said, Daddy saw you at church Sunday night. I said, yes, sir. He says, thank you for coming. He said, I hope you don't think that Daddy preached the return of the prodigal son because you was in the back row. I said, no, Daddy, I know you'd never do nothing like that. He said, God told me that message two or three weeks ago. I said, yes, sir. I said, I know that, Daddy. He said, I saw a brother, whoever it was, I ain't going to tell you because you might know him. One of our deacons come up and begin to deal with you to go to the altar. I said, yes, sir. He said, I've seen you leave. He said, after church, Daddy called him in the office. He said, I appreciate you having a burden for Billy. He says, but don't, don't embarrass my boy like that again. He said, you just pray for him and let God do the work. I said, I know that, Daddy. He said, Daddy's still praying for you. Well, a little bit after that, I got sick. The drinking, I got the ulcer in my stomach. Do our ulcer. It turned, what do they call that? It's when it turns green, you know what I mean, whatever that is. Yes, gang green. Gang green set in. I was just a kid. They started, they said, we're going to have to operate on him. Daddy and mom and Ma Broy, mom's mother, was over in Colorado on a, on a little vacation. We tried to get a hold of daddy and we couldn't find him. They took me in the hospital and I was dying. The doctor said, we're going to operate at 9 o'clock in the morning. He said, we can't wait for Reverend Brandon. So my grandmother signed the thing. And it's going to take a do all do a denim out and put a colostomy bag on my side. Sixteen years. Old. Going to put this bag on my side. He said, "If you don't, you're going to die." So they agreed. Couldn't get a hold of Daddy. Seven o'clock that morning, while well, they operated on me, or eight or whatever it was, I felt somebody touch me on the shoulder. I looked up. There he stood. He said, what's wrong, son? And I began to tell him. He said, you remember the day in Vandalia, Illinois, when the angel that you seen in the room? That's the beginning of my testimony, and I am ending. And I'm sorry I've kept you late. He says, he come to me. I couldn't get a hold of him. The people couldn't get a hold of him. We didn't know where he's at. He said, he spoke to me on the mountain and said, get to Billy right away. I said, pray for me, Daddy. He says, I ain't going to do it. Come on, young people. Yeah. He said, I ain't going to do it. Well, I knew I was dead. And he said, Aubrey, I was dead. And I said, why? He said, because I didn't do no sinning. He said, you done the sinning. You're the one that left. But he said, remember Daddy telling you the road back would be hard? I said, yes, sir. He said, but I told you I claimed you over here. He said, do you want to give your heart to Jesus? I said, yes, I do. And I repented of my sins there on that bed. The doctor come in. And he said, Reverend, I'm glad you're here, Billy. You know, all this story. He said, would you take him up and examine him one more time? 
He said, Reverend Branham, it won't do no good. He said, we've done it every day for two weeks. He said, the boy is going to die. Daddy says, but you don't know Dr. Brenner. He said, he's been away from God, but he's come home today. Amen. Yeah. He said, he's come home today. And he says, and when he's come home today, he said, take him up one more time. And he said, if you will, he said, examine him one more time. Amen. He went up. When he went up like that, they come back down. He said, Reverend Branham, <clears throat> he says, I don't know what happened, but yesterday this duodenum was bleeding. He says, but this morning it's dried up. Change that to Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He says, it's dried up. He said, your boy don't need no operation. He said, but my boy has come home today. My prodigal son has returned. There's all kind of traps for you out there, young people. You might not love Brother Billy as much as you did. I told you all the things that I've seen, and I told you the truth. But don't you think that Satan won't come and knock at your door? There's the warriors of the faith. You're here today. You're here today by the grace of God, but because of their faith, and they're placing the token over their families. Don't go that route. It's a hard road. But if you do choose that route, can I read a quote, Brother Paul? The twelfth chapter of 1 Corinthians says, By one spirit, we are all baptized into one body and become members of that body. And then it's not what I've done. What I am, who I was, or nothing about it. It's what God has done for me in Christ Jesus. We are perfected with our sacrifice. He makes no mistakes. He would not bring you in if you wasn't worthy. None of you see what I see. When he talked to me, I listened. Continue. He wouldn't bring you in if you wasn't worthy. He knows your heart. That's exactly right. He knows who you are, what you are. He knows your every motive. He knows who you are and what you are. But there's traps set along the way for you, along that road. The devil, this is Brother Brown. Mm -hmm. The devil will cause you to stumble and fall. Yes, he does. And you say, I didn't mean to do that, God. You know I didn't. Oh, listen. You're still perfect. Amen. Because there's a perfect blood offered for you every day. And a bleeding sacrifice hanging there before the throne of Almighty God. You know it because it's God's coordination. For this gospel is delivered. It's called the good news. And this morning, isn't that strange? And this morning, the Holy Spirit, through His Word, is bringing you the good news. That before the foundation of the world... God wrote your name. God wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life with his. All the devils in hell can't take it out of there. God done spoken and it has to happen. His name is Jesus. 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 Oh, there's just something about that name. God bless you, honey. 
What is he? He's master. He's my savior. He's my Jesus. It's like a fragrance after the rain. Oh, love him now. Oh, Jesus. That's right. Jesus is Jesus. Let all heavens and earth proclaim. Come on out, church. Kings and kingdoms, they will all, they'll all pass away. But there's something about that name, that name. I love you. God bless you.